Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome to this month's episode of Get Used To It, a lesbian and gay issues discussion show by us, for us, and everybody in the audience who's watching, of course. Um, since uh, many of the cities in the country, including LA and San Francisco and various other cities in California, celebrate lesbian and gay pride in the months of May and June, we decided to devote our June show to the question, the issue, and I guess the answer uh, about pride in our community. And to that end, we have wonderful guests, as usual. The first half of the show, we're going to be talking about the growth of pride in our community. The second half of the show, sort of how it manifests itself now and into the future. So for this first half, I'm very, very pleased and honored to have on the show two, I would say, long time, if that even began to describe it, uh, activists in our community. Uh, the first, Jewel Tice Williams, who for over 20 years has been the owner of Catch One, who describes herself as a businesswoman with a social conscience. And Maurice Kite, who is one of the architects of our lesbian and gay liberation movement in LA, in California, and in the country. Welcome both. I'm very, very pleased to have both of you here. Thank you, Sheila. Thank well, you, on the issue of pride, we have lots of it now these days, but it wasn't always like that, was it? We, um, we must have started out small, no, afraid. it wasn't I mean, always that way. In 1969, the state of affairs for lesbian and gay people was sick, sad, sorry. There were two distinct classes of lesbian and gay people, those in trouble and those troubled. Hmm. There was also a group of people having a lot of fun. It wasn't all bad, but in general, lesbian and gay people had internalized their own suffering, their own pain. If everybody you meet treats you as if you were sick, sinful, deviant, bad, abnormal, and excludable, you can exclude yourself. You can engage in your own alleged inferiority, and many of us did that. And also, a lot of, of members of our community were in trouble, serious trouble, trouble with the law, trouble with employers, trouble with the bank, trouble with family. It wasn't easy. And in 1969, 70, 71, we pulled off a worldwide nonviolent revolution of great quality, <laughs> and it's worked. Well, it certainly was the beginning. Um, what were the first sort of stirrings of pride or organization, or what, what, how do you see it, Jewel, in terms of the community, or communities? Yes, um, there are a lot of communities that are involved in the, the gay and lesbian liberation movement. And in the early days, these communities were quite separate, too. Um, it was separated by gender, by race, by socioeconomic standing, a lot of separation. By sexuality. Oh, yes. Oh. The degree of sexuality. Oh, mm -hmm. for sure. We mm -hmm. had that, that, that separation, too. So we had a, different groups of people getting together, a lot in house parties, and then we became more political as uh, some of us became free or self-employed in that we were able to kind of transcend um, the climate of, of what most people had to deal with. What and was the climate like for you personally? I mean, what was, if, if you don't mind telling sure. us, sort of how, how was it and how did you then come to, to think about coming out? Oh yeah, personally um, for me it was a lot of fear. I was a fear of afraid I guess most of my family and friends finding out that I was gay. I ventured out to tell a couple of people and uh, one of my close friends and, and one of my sisters and, and the result was plenty of crying boohooing and I was, oh, you just can't be like that and you can't do this to us more or less, you know. And I didn't have the answers myself in those days, you know, that I'm not doing this to anyone, you know, this is my gift and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I didn't have those answers in the early days. And there was really no place for us to go for those answers, too. How did people meet each other or know um, about each other? Sure, the, the meetings came about in, in clubs primarily. Uh, that was, this was pre-Bathhouse, pre-Metropolitan um, Community Church or Unity Fellowship Church. There was no place that we could go except for the bars um, to meet people. And, um, the Catch One has been open, like you said, in, in uh, the beginning for, for the last 20 years. So even though there were smaller pubs around and 
uh, after hours and underground secret places, you know, clandestine places where, where we met, um, the Catch One became the, the largest and the center, more or less, for black gays and lesbians to meet people and to begin organizations such as MAP and Unity Fellowship and the Black Gay and Lesbian Community, uh, Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum. And just uh, in the early days, we had a Black Gay Coalition. Mm -hmm. And um, these groups all started at the, at the catch and through this um, social place where we could go and be comfortable. You know, for me, I know when uh, before catch days and when I first um, came out, I would s slip out of the house in the dark so that my neighbors wouldn't see me and get in the car and put on my what I call motel socks and, <laughs> and my tie, <laughs> you know, break down in the car more or less. Um, because I didn't want anybody to see me or to know, you know, that I was gay. So it was like you could only be who you really were, kind of, I mean, in transition to where it was more comfortable. Was yes. it comfortable in the clubs or was it, did it feel kind of closed in? No, it was pretty comfortable in, in, the, in the clubs. Oh, there was a lesbian bar over on, on South Vermont called If Club which was a great place. Yeah. Gee whiz, an <laughs> awful lot of lesbians of all the social classes and all the habituations, from quite butch dyke to very femme, you know. <laughs> and there was some great role playing in those days. That yes. was before, uh -huh. before now. It was great role playing. Oh, there's still this great role true. playing, I, I know. think, in some For parts. Some yeah. men also went to the IF Club, including a certain number of non-gay men uh -huh. who've always had a fascination with lesbianism. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure why. <laughs> in any case, the IF Club was a hell of a place. Oh, it was wonderful. It was famous. Lesbians came from all over to go to the IF Club, had very little trouble with the police, some, because the police were a monolith and oppression of lesbian and gay persons, but they came to the IF Club very little. I think for one thing, they were kind of frightened of, uh, you know, a little bit frightened of. We're tough, there's no question. I think that was <laughs> right. part of it. <laughs> and also, the police just didn't want to admit that women did those things. Right. It was okay to, to put men down, but they just wanted to bring women in. Mm -hmm. Well, Morris, how about uh, in terms of the, essentially, the white male community? and must have been just as painful, just as in the closet, few places to go. How did we make the transition be from the sort of the club scene, I suppose yeah. you would call it, to the more institutionalized community that we see today? It wasn't easy. It was done in increments. The first increment was the anti-war movement. Hmm. Uh, lesbian gay people watched the same television as us watches. And we saw people committing civil disobedience, uh, demonstrating, uh, blocking entrances to buildings, uh, doing a whole variety of things. Uh, but, and we were a part of that. We were a real integral, important part of that, but in the closet. Lesbian gay people were seeing a black African-American self-determination movement of great quality. And some lesbian gay people were members of that. The real architect of modern lesbian gay liberation is an African-American woman by the name of Rosalie Parks, who in October of 1955 in Montgomery, Alabama, sat in the front of the bus, hmm. a forbidden thing. Uh, the motor was stopped. The driver was parked at the curb. He started the motor thinking the sound of the motor would return her sanity, and she didn't move. And he moved the bus, thinking the sound of the wheels on the pavement would bring her could sanity back. Could not imagine back. that she could have done it on purpose. And two, <laughs> and two blocks away, he came to her and he said, um, you're going to have to move to the rear of the bus or I'm going to have you arrested. And she said, these are exact words, you just do that because today I'm not going to the rear of the bus. And in saying that, she liberated all the rest of us. So we benefited from her pioneering. And in 1969, a grassroots, really in that way, grassroots movement sprung, uh, sprung up. Gay liberation fronts sprung up in New York, Berkeley, California, Los Angeles, California. San Francisco, California, San Jose, California, in that first year, five. And then in 1970, 385 sprung up. I know because I kept a directory of them, mm -hmm. kept a list of them, and was in contact with many of them. Was Morris, I know that you've said, I'm sorry, in the past, mm -hmm. uh, about the somewhat unique nature of things that started in LA, 
that, and I love to hear that because I grew up in L.A. and I am real proud of it, but yeah. I know that there are several things that sort of, we have some firsts here, I think. Really do. I'm an internationalist and I, I really, I am a generalist, a universalist, and I'm proud of that. However, I need to engage a little geographical chauvinism and say that Los Angeles is where it started. And Dignity, mobility. lesbian and gay Catholic group started here, an important group. Lesbian and gay Catholics do not wish to leave the church. They want to stay in the church, they want to be loyal, they want to engage in the communion, and they still want to be lesbian and gay. And they started here and it's a worldwide movement. Metropolitan Community Church came out of this city. Gay Christians who do not wish to leave the church, who want to be Christian, want to practice that. And, and it happened here and it's a, it's a worldwide movement. The, uh, Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center was the first ever in history. Never before had lesbian and gay people said, we know how to do something they don't know. We know how to serve one another. We know the language, we know the habits, we know the custom, and we can relate. And so the center came out of the nonviolent revolution. I could go on and on and on with these well, Beth Haim Hadashim also. Beth Haim Hadashim, the very first Jewish temple in history. Imagine. A 4,500-year-old religion, and I guess there have been an awful lot of gay people in it over the years, but believe me, Not so they were noticed. in the closet. Right. And Beit Haim Haidashim came out of the city, and that was the role model for the others, and that also is happening, including in Jerusalem. Huh. There's a gay and lesbian synagogue meeting quietly and privately in Jerusalem, and fairly soon they'll be on the main drag with the flag of the state of Israel flying over their That's temple amazing. too. Isn't that good news? It's wonderful. Well, the church has also, I think, played a very important, though very some, sometimes different role in the uh, African-American community. I know you were talking to me the other day about, and we've talked before, about the sort of the feeling of, uh, you know, of not being a worthwhile human, of God not loving us, etc. cetera. Um, and yet you were talking to me about how after uh, the catch opened that somehow the uh, people who went there used the catch sometimes to to bring their families back to together to see sort of that their life was okay yes this is um, true Sheila the catch has served um, the african-american community in many many ways and one of the ways that I'm most proud of is the fact that a lot of I call them the kids my children would bring their parents to the club just for them to see that it wasn't some seedy, dark place where everybody's groping and that, that they would get a sense of where they really go. And um, consequently, I made good friends with a lot of parents, a lot of brothers and sisters, a lot of ex-wives, a lot of ex-husbands, <laughs> huh. and uh, a lot of children of, of some of the uh, older gays and lesbians. There's always been a powerful underground of lesbian and gay concerns in the African-American community. The Renaissance in Harlem in the 20s, a great deal of that was led by lesbian and gay people, including Julian L. Tinge, a distinguished African-American actor who wore women's attire a lot of the time and appeared on stage and was honored and applauded. If, if there's time for me to cry it on the agenda, I want a campaign to get a theater named in Harlem, the Julian L. Tinge Memorial Theater. Would you join me in doing that? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> or I'll bet you'll always have another two minutes for yeah. another project. Well, you were talking about the center and its the sort of the importance, not just symbolically, but in terms of real services given. You had something to do with getting that open, didn't I you? I'm thrilled that I did. When I walk in front of 1625 North Hudson, every That's now and the, then I... the new I'd center building here. On, on Hudson Avenue in Hollywood. When I walk by it, I tear up occasionally because I went around the streets of this city on a not-for-fee, non-judgmental basis serving lesbian and gay people. I had training in how to do that. And I developed a lot of clients. And my telephone number became kind of famous, Madison 0894. And it was written on Western Walls. I'm not sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that about you, but I'm relieved used to, to hear that it was put that down, word. but I didn't mind. You weren't in there, right? And, <laughs> and I, I received a call in 1960 from a man saying, they told me somebody at the end of this phone can help me. I said, yes, I'm Maurice Kite, and I can do that. What's wrong? He said, I was arrested. I was in a John bust washroom, mm -hmm. and I'm heterosexually married, and I have a family. 
and I'm disgraced. I said, oh, please cut it out, you're not disgraced. The first thing to do is to get hold of yourself, restore your self-confidence. I know that won't be easy. And we'll get you a lawyer and so on and so on. We got this case dismissed. He calls me each year on the anniversary of that day to say thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, I developed contacts and who to deal with, who not to deal with, and what police officers could possibly be trusted, and what doctors could treat sexually transmitted diseases, and what counselor, and so on and so on. And by 1969, I had accumulated sufficient wherewithal and sufficient out lesbian and gay persons, sufficient radicals from the Dow Action Committee, which I had also founded in the 60s, that I was able in 1969 to found the Gay Liberation Front, and we made the Gay Survival Committee an important component of the Gay Liberation Front, different than all the others in the whole world. Our served social services. Mm -hmm. And then in 70, we enhanced that, and by the spring of 71, I brought together a meeting of the Gay Liberation Front, and I said to my brothers and sisters, I think we've passed our usefulness. I think we should dissolve. Why well, had to be saved in the mob? Why you <laughs> rat fink, how dare you sell us out, you know? We've only, I said, no, well, believe that if you want, but I'm telling you, you passed your usefulness. By April of 1971, we met to found the center, and in May of 71, it was launched. The rest is glorious history. It is the model for all of the others springing up everywhere all around the world. Hearing Mar uh, Morris talk about the, um, the different laws that were in effect you know, in in those days, that um, at the at the um, club level, there was no da same sex dancing allowed. Hmm. So the disco dancing came as a result of the Gay Liberation Front, right? And and hmm. us being able to dance with each other without, without touching. touching. And um, and there was an injunction against the the city then to enforce it. Uh, uh, to not to enforce their dancing, uh, same-sex dancing together, and uh, so that put them on hold from being able to come in and even harass us about whether we touched each other or not. That's well, there must have been some sense of how important the clubs and the bars were to us, in a way. I mean, oh. you know, because I, whenever the police come down on you for something, you know that you're doing something political. It's not individual they just don't like us kind of thing so this sense this place where we organized before the center before any of the other sort of more institutional places before organizations of which as you pointed out there are now you know thousands and thousands mm -hmm. that these were the places where we could find each other and probably the beginning the wellspring of the political movement the lesbian gay yes. bar was our home our temple our lodge our church and many people got their mail because they were essentially homeless, got their mail and messages at, at, at a gay bar. We gathered there when we were pained, and we gathered there when we were rejoicing. Many of us also gathered there and got hooked on alcohol, mm -hmm. because that was our environment. We were dependent upon that. Make it clear that the bar proprietors were not urging us to become alcoholic. We simply did it to ourselves. We used then the gay bar as the place in which to organize also. A lot of those very early meetings were held in gay bars. And we went marching out of gay bars and into the streets with a, with a banner, give me a G, give me an A, give me a Y, give me an L, give me an E, and so on and so on. And, and so I'm sentimental mm -hmm. about the lesbian gay bars because they were so powerful. In well, next year we're going to celebrate an uprising that came out of one out of, of the, the bars. Sure. Out, out of the Stonewall Inn. the Stonewall Inn, the last right. Sunday in June of 1969. Uh, customers at the Stonewall Inn, located at 59 Christopher Street in the village, across from Christopher Park and in Sheridan Square, the New York Police Department of the city and the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board of the state of New York came to the Stonewall Inn, presumably to hassle the management about the unlicensed nature of the premises. It wasn't licensed. They had other licenses. They bought the liquor at other places and brought it there. So they came in to check it out. And uh, as the police were likely to do, they became oppressive in dealing with the customers. And it was a hot, muggy night. Have you ever been in New York in the, in the summertime? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're wet through your underwear. Not if I can five. help it. You're wet <laughs> through your underwear in 10 minutes in a non-air conditioned building. It wasn't air conditioned. Also, there was black self-determination movement going on. And also, there was an anti-war mo movement going on. And for just a whole variety of magical reasons, the customers decided mm -hmm. not to take it. And they went outside. And rather than slinking away, as we'd always done, they stayed. 
and there's a lot of broken furniture in the streets of New York. It's a badly run city. Most are now. And they stacked the furniture and started setting fire to it. That attracted the fire department with their sirens, and that attracted more police with their sirens, and that attracted the press with their sirens, and more and more people came, and so there were three days of nonviolent rioting. And the rest is kind of wonderful history. Mm -hmm. It really is wonderful history. Yes, it is. Yes. Now, the, the thing that's interesting, though, is that I know we've we talked more than we have time for on the show mm -hmm. for all of the, you know, the stories and threads. But it seemed as though, and as you know, we're going to talk with uh, Jean Cordova. Um, we, we'll catch up with her for an extra segment on the marvelous show. Marvelous sister, marvelous sister. And, but the threads were somewhat disparate, as, as they have been in, uh, among all communities, in building any kind of a unified movement. I mean, I wouldn't say the movement's exactly unified at the moment. That's but our we're strength. more together than we've been, That's don't our strength. Mm -hmm. That's our strength. Yes. Our strength is that we're, that we're not all alike. We're not a monolith. If, we, if we're a monolith, one dramatic, charismatic leader could lead us across the bridge. Yes, they criticize us for not. They mm -hmm. keep saying, now where's your Martin Luther King? Could lead us across the bridge. Keep saying, count them up. And on the other side, we <laughs> run into the sheriff and the dogs and the fire hoses and lead you right back across the bridge. Right. No, our strength is that we are disparate, that we are from many places. We have a variety of organizations, but the magic is to try to seek communication among ourselves, and we do that, and we do it better and better and better, don't we? Do you agree, Jim? Yeah, I, I would like to, um, to just add, add some to that. In, in the early days, uh, there were definitely separate groups, and, and pretty much there were maybe two or three women in the club, in my club, with 400 guys. Right. And even, um, like I said, the, the women and the men didn't get together and party that much. And, and Catch One was over here, and West Hollywood was over there, and, and the Twains didn't meet at all. Mm -hmm. And over the years, it has evolved so that the distance between West Hollywood and, and Central or South Central LA is, is narrowing. And for sure, the distance between um, gays and lesbians have narrowed. Mm -hmm. um, I was, one of the things I was looking forward to was the day when, when we could all get together and, and party and it wouldn't be about who was this or who was that, or I don't like this, or I don't we'll, like we'll that. We'll do that the last Sunday in June at Christopher Street West. Yeah. Well, it's, it's happened. 350,000 hours, we'll get together and do just that. Yeah. You Powerful statement. We've only got a minute or so left in our, um, in our time here, and I wanted to make sure that you got to tell the people out there in television land, as they used to say, about the McCadden Collection, about Rue's Place, because we're going to let them know at the end of the show what these phone numbers are. So please I, do, so I'm that we don't cut you off I'm founder curator of, of the McCadden Place Collection. It's called that because it was created in the compound where I've lived for 17 years. It's the largest collection in the world of posters, prints, paintings, and so on, having to do with the lesbian gay experience. It's long since outgrown me, and I've given it to the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, and the number is 213-463-3928. Thank you. Uh, Rue's house is my spouse Rue's baby, and it's a home for women and children with AIDS. Uh, the telephone number is area code 213-295-4030. Tremendous work. Uh, we began all by ourselves with it. The community has rallied around. It's four years old now. Thank you very much. I'm really, really happy that I had you on this show. I hope that it will be at least a hundred times more. And now I want you to listen to uh, the time that I caught up with Jean Cordova. Jean is a longtime lesbian activist in Los Angeles and uh, Southern California and really nationally. And wanted to ask her some of the same questions about pride. I think in terms of the separate strands in the women's community, I know that there was, you know, like the bar women and the lesbian feminist women and then the leftist women from the anti-war movement. <clears throat> and I think uh, Jewel has, has talked a little bit about the, the bar women and that being the social place. I think for lesbian feminists, um, we're kind of a little slow to the notion of gay pride because there was some separatism. Lesbian feminists were more imbued with pride about being women and why, weren't quite sure how they fit into the homosexual movement or the gay movement. In fact, the definition of lesbian was that the lesbian feminist offered was that a lesbian was the rage of all women condensed to the point of explosion. Mm -hmm. So that was a real angry definition. And I think pride involved a lot of uh, 
kind of throwing off the shackles. It's like, you know, just coming up from slavery type of thing for both women and, and queer men at the time. Um, and I think it had a lot to do with um, also shame in wasted years about not knowing who you were. The repression was much stronger then. Uh, certainly for women coming out of heterosexual marriages uh, and finding the alternative of being lesbian. That was just a, a mind-blowing thing to them, uh, that there was such an alternative, that they have never been told about it. So there was some anger ar about that. I think everybody's first couple years of, of uh, being gay or being in the movement at that time was an angry and, and joyful expression. Uh, but mostly it was sort of, you know, filled with all those words I can't say here on, on TV. <laughs> like, you know, off yours and stuff like that. It was just a, a, a real anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian, anti-straight pride. The Lesbian Tide started as almost a gay women's magazine, and so we started kind of tamely as the DOB newsletter, and we talked about doing educational things and maybe speaking at colleges, you know, and that was sort of the, you know, the, the left fringe of, you know, how, of how out there we were going to be. But as it evolved, we started taking on, um, you know, straight media, and we became the voice of radical lesbian feminism during the early 70s and which was decidedly anti-male, actually. Uh, but that also helped give women pride in being who they were independent from men. So the point wasn't being anti-male, the point was to be free of men. Well, in the very early days, when I worked with Morris Kite, it was one movement, we had this little gay liberation front. Mm -hmm. And you know, and there was sort of like 120 men and maybe eight women, and we kind of worked together. Uh, when feminism came into the movement, it separated the men and the women for quite some time. I would say from 1970, probably almost till 1980, uh, with the high point being in the middle, dyke separatism. Um, I think the men were left very much to do their own movement, which was the gay movement, and the women were doing either the women's movement or lesbian separatism. Um, since that time, of course, it's come together much more. But I think that was probably a healthy thing for women to learn to act on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and there were organizations that worked together. I myself always, because I came from being a gay woman first. I spent three years in the bar, so I knew I was a homosexual queer before I was a lesbian feminist. <laughs> so for me, gay men were always my brothers. Um, and there were a group of women who always felt that, but it wasn't politically correct to work with gay men for a period of five or six years there. Mm -hmm. To me, I see three separate stages of pride here. The first was the angry phase, like I said. The second was the homemaking phase, which was we built the gay ghetto. There, uh, all these institutions, one we're sitting in now, and the millions uh, across, not the millions, but tens of thousands of gay institutions, centers, bookstores, bars, we spent the 70s and early 80s building a ghetto that would feel very nice to us. Now I call it a ghetto because it's not really the real world, but it was a hell of a lot better than the nothing that was there before. Mm -hmm. So to me that that was a community building phase. Now what I see with young people um, in terms of gay pride is I think we're on the cusp of a brand new sense of pride which is going into the whole world and claiming it as ours, mm -hmm. going out of our ghettos. Like the kids today are saying, well, why should we just have this measly little ghetto called West Hollywood or the Castro or the New York? We want the whole world. We want, you know, all the high schools. We belong in the world. And we don't intend to stay politely in our ghetto. Um, and I think that's a whole new step in pride, mm -hmm. saying that, uh, we are exactly like straight people in terms of what we should have as uh, access, access to power, to schools, uh, libraries, um, jobs, housing. You know, I think someday um, gays will be like it is in probably Denmark, uh, just a natural part of society. Our people will move in society. We probably won't need all of our exclusive institutions 
because it'll be a lot easier just to go to the, the neighborhood uh, attorney or, or doctor or whatever. Don't go away. Get used to it. We'll be right back. Who cares? It's their fault. So what? Some fag get beat up. Oh! Ah! It's their own fault. Ah! Dang it. Hi, welcome back to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host, and as you know, if you've been watching, we're talking today about lesbian and gay pride. Uh, we're doing something a little different with the show today. We started out with uh, three wonderful guests talking about sort of the growth of our pride and our history, and now I have three entirely different and new guests for the last half of the show to talk about what's going on in the community now, uh, things that we are proud of, how our pride is growing, and sort of how we're going about that. So I'm very pleased to introduce three new people to you. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Gabriel Ariola, who's a Chicano AIDS activist. Welcome. And next to him, Kay Osberg, who is the Deputy Director of Operations at the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center. Welcome, Kay. Thanks. And next to Kay, John Heilman, who is a City Council member of the West Hollywood City Council. Welcome, John. Thank you. Welcome, all of you. Well, you sort of saw what we talked about in the first half of the show with uh, Jewel and Maurice and uh, kind of the growth of our community and uh, almost stumbling ways and kind of literally out of the darkness of self-hatred and into a kind of a new pride. And here we are in 1993. Um, and I guess my question to you is, how does our pride express itself now in various ways in which you might uh, be hooked in? Gabriel, you for a start, for instance. Um. I guess as a street activist, I really see our pride, um, it's, it's very much out there. I mean, people can take to the streets uh, wearing a skirt, wearing uh, in full drag. We have festivals, we have films, although not enough, and sometimes not totally appealing. But we are visible. I guess visibility is our biggest thing, and I think that there is... Um, a greater level of visible pride that we are able to show the world that we are a people, that we have a culture, we have a past, and that we are proud of that past and we are proud of who we are and how we've gotten here and how long it's taken us to get here. So it's sort of a way of, uh, first of all, we got to know about our past, which uh, actually a lot of us don't. I don't think we have, you know, between the, uh, uh, what Maurice was talking about in terms of the uh, McCadden collection and the June Mazur collection, too that we at least have a shot at uh, seeing what it is and what we've done. But, so is it, I mean, one person in drag walking down the street might be very proud, but would also might still be in some danger. So I, I, I get a sense in terms of grassroots organizing that it really has to do with, with the collective of us, with being visible, with being sort of in people's faces mm. about it. Uh, I think it has to be on all levels, whether it's a large group or one person just simply coming out at the office and letting, when somebody asks or for whatever reason, letting them know, yes, I am, I am a gay man or I am a lesbian. Letting those people know, even from the very basic rudimentary step of letting a friend or a family member or a coworker know who you, who you are and that you are this person and I'm not going to sit here and hide and, you know, pretend and giggle at, you know, the macho woman jokes, you know, oh yeah, her, and you, you kind of silently giggle just to kind of not feel left out or just to kind of blend in. So it's almost like being proud is related to not being ashamed. In other words, it's a, it's a losing a, shame kind of proposition. Yes, it's absolutely. It's being proud from, being, starting with the pride, and I think this is where pride really needs to go in terms of speaking of pride in future, pride within ourselves. I think as a community we need to learn, to, as a community of, of gays and lesbians, we need to take pride from within and we need to be proud 24 hours a day. From the, from the moment you get up in the morning and when you go to sleep, you have gay dreams, you have whatever, <laughs> you're proud from, from all 24 hours. There's never a moment where you sit there and say, well, you know, you kind of him or you hot. No, there's, there's just no, there's no room for that. You really have to be proud all the time and you just have to learn to show that. And when you're proud all the time, it's not a, a struggle to come out of the office because you're already proud, and it just shows naturally. Okay, you've been active. Well, you're working at the center now, which mm -hmm. is a fairly new position for you. Yeah, that is fairly new. I've uh, 
been at the uh, uh, LA Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center, what a nice mouthful, <laughs> for, uh, for a few months now and I've got to say that's an amazing institution. Anybody who hasn't come down and seen the new building, and I have to tell you Sheila, it's kind of ironic because it was the old IRS building uh -huh. and uh, what happened was uh, we went uh, to the IRS, the, the, the Gay and Lesbian Community Services Center when we first wanted to incorporate and they refused to allow us to do it thinking there's no way a gay and lesbian organization could be considered benevolent or charitable <laughs> or so, educational or educational they know, right? Right? <laughs> so here we are now uh, living in that building and it's if for anybody it you know, right out from under him didn't yeah, that's we? right we did <laughs> so for anyone who hasn't seen it you've got to come down because it's just an amazing institution and one of the great things about it I think uh, talking about pride obviously I have a lot of pride in that building uh, is that it doesn't it serves I mean I think of our, our, our community as really a lot of communities um, with some common goals and purposes but it serves an enormous range of people including some of the people who are having the toughest time because of oppression of gay men and lesbians um, street youth we serve we serve homeless gay and lesbian adults uh, we help people get jobs uh, we have an incredible range of programs we give free legal advice uh, and it's just a, an amazing amazing place we do 400 uh, women's uh, 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 events hold meetings there every month so it just it goes on and on but come down and see it if you haven't been there and if you've got some money chip in or if you have a friend who has a need <laughs> send them in to get services well you know Morris was uh, when was one of the founders of the center mm -hmm. and they basically started in a shoebox mm -hmm. and then in a slightly yep. larger room and then moved to a little building mm -hmm. which was pretty you know seedy and run down mm -hmm. even by his own description mm -hmm. But he used to talk about how people would call because they, they could not bring themselves to cross the street. Right. It happened when right. we were on Highland, too. Right. Couldn't cross the street because it's a, it's a way of coming out, it is. in a way, it to is. walk in the door. Although a lot of straight people I know are using the medical services yeah. at the center. Yeah, um, we have a women HIV program that right. is... Uh, yeah. But it's still a statement, in mm -hmm. a way. And it so is. the center becomes, like a lot of our other institutions, I think, a symbol. What about the national institutions? I know you've been involved with HRCF. Yeah, I worked with the Human Rights Campaign Fund out of D.C., uh, who, which is a political advocate institution along with the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, some of the two biggest ones that are doing our lobbying work in D.C. I was also with the March on Washington for 87. Did tons of work on that and that was amazing. And I, I think through that uh, I became pretty aware of the fact that the gay and lesbian movement has grown with, by leaps and bounds. Uh, in the last 10, 15, I'm sure you can go back even 25 years, but I would say in the last 10 years we have seen just amazing movements Movement. And in the last year, with an administration coming on that's saying, oh, there are gay and lesbian people, which is a first, uh, you know. Saying the words. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> saying the words. You know, I just love watching the Joint Chiefs of Staff, whatever their position are, and it's just saying the Having words. Having to say it's, lesbian, yeah. of course, it's not that they're saying anything very nice about yeah. us. But. So I think we've come miles and miles. Uh, the, uh, the 87 march was attended by 650,000. This one probably, the 93, probably a million. 79 was 100,000. So you can see the growth of people willing to come out, take a stand saying, we're not going to sit back, we want to see our rights. In the time I was at the Human Rights Campaign Fund, uh, they went from having maybe uh, three lobbyists to seven lobbyists because, and, and even those are scurrying around taking phone calls saying, yes, we'd love to get to that issue, but, you know, we've got to focus on the military and the civil rights bill and, uh, uh, and issues of women's health in particular are big ones for them. So, so I think that there's just an um, amazing amount of work to be done, but uh, now there's an ever-growing number of people to do it. And for me, walking into the center, there's 175 staff people in this place. It's a gay and lesbian institution with 175 staff people. Well, the youth services phenomenal. program is bigger than any, I mean, if, in the country, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's huge. Uh, Hedrick Martin is the only other one that's uh, of comparable size, but uh, it's enormous. 24 uh, bed shelter on the premises. So we've got an institution. We've got a place that's an institution symbolized by a glorious building and... And rainbow and, flags. And so. rainbow flags. Yeah, that's right. That's yes. great. Well, John, I know um, sort of an... an I guess kind of a progression of thought, at least on my part, in thinking about putting this together. Um, we talk about community and grassroots organizing, talk about our own kind of institutions, not just political action and the center, but I mean the, the gay and lesbian uh, western dancing club of Horses Breath Montana. I mean, we, you know, we, there are thousands and thousands of our own groups and institutions and places to go. But the further thing then had to do with our presence in their world 
kind of their institutions. And I guess, though West Hollywood is thought of as a place that's more gay positive maybe in government than almost anywhere else, except maybe Berkeley or other, I don't know where, P-Town, um, what aspect of pride do you think is involved in, in our involvement in their institutions? Well, that, that was what I was thinking about when I heard Morris and Jewel talking earlier is, you know, they were talking about the early days when the issue was really survival and, and really having to fight for survival. It was sort of an attitude of please leave us alone and, and just let us get on with our lives. And I think people more in my generation were growing up with the attitude of we can do anything that you do and we can be equal on your terms. And so you see lots of people who are running for office, getting elected um, in places that do not necessarily have a, a gay and lesbian constituency or a large gay and lesbian constituency, um, and, and really succeeding in all of those other institutions, in elected office, as judges, as lawyers, as professors, um, as doctors. And you see this tremendous uh, rise in people, gay and lesbian, who are open, who are in leadership positions in other organizations. And, and as Gabriel was talking, I was thinking that the shift I see now is you know, our people, or my generation was sort of growing up with this notion of equality and we're everywhere and we're just the same as you. And I think some of the newer and younger people are saying, no, we're different from you and uh, we don't care what you think about us. And I, I, it's exciting to see that development and that growth, the, the courage and the um, confidence of people to say, yes, I wear different clothes or I pierce my nose or whatever I do and that's the way I want to be and leave me alone and I'm, I'm, I'm happy the way I am. Well, it feels to me like these things coexist and I guess mm -hmm. one of the questions is, do they, are, are they connected to each other? I mean, I understand that any one lesbian or gay man can be proud, right? Mm -hmm. But that, and it's and it's wonderful to be on the street, and uh, it feels dangerous a little bit, you know, declaring or going to a club just because you want to dance and you don't want to be political and sort mm -hmm. of declaring, or working in mm -hmm. the movement mm -hmm. and kind of declaring or being out, you know. But is there a connection between these different ways in which we're proud? Well, I mean, I think there's just a historic connection. I think the street activism uh, was is the beginning. Uh, and we, as a movement, um, as a part of the civil rights struggle, which is how I see us, uh, we had uh, done the first step of what a civil rights struggle is, taken to the streets. And I think that is a critical element. It remains a critical element. I'm sure Gabriel could talk about what it's meant to the AIDS movement in this country to have an ACT UP, to have the marches, to have all that happening. Uh, and more people are out and willing to do it. It's not until we get that that we have enough people to build our own institutions. It's not until we have our own institutions that we can put pressure on the political institutions uh, to be responsive to the needs of our community, to see us as a community, to believe we actually have, uh, in this case, I think a number of communities because, uh, you know, I think you can look at the uh, black lesbian community as an isolated community with issues, the, you know, uh, 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 pan-Asian community, the disabled lesbian community, et cetera. You could look at a lot of our different communities and clearly we have some common threads, but it's through that progression, I think, that uh, we've gotten where we are in terms of political power and it's a pretty amazing how quickly it's happened for us and not that there isn't tons of work to do. So we're, all, we're all just part of the whole. I mean there's I guess and many of the street activism is like the groundwork that mm -hmm. laid the foundation for everything else to progress from there. Um, but we're all working parts of the whole. We've everything works with everything else. Even at times where we don't even see the connections, something that an ACT UP demonstration may do may lead for something that the Gay and Lesbian Center can latch onto when they do lobbying mm -hmm. that in turn, you know, helps when we have a politician, you know, somebody in a political office to just keep the progression going. It's like a ripple effect. You can't drop a pebble in the water without having ripples. And I think that's very much the way the whole thing happens, although we have lots of pebbles and lots of different, because like Jewel mentioned earlier, we're um, communities. It's not one community. We're not like many of the other minority groups that are out there where we have just, you know, the uh, Afro-Americans or the Latinos. We are made up of many, many communities and I think that that's where our activism, our street activism comes from because there is a specific need for black lesbians mm -hmm. or for 
gay Hispanic men or for um, many of the other groups out there, you know, Catholic, gay Catholics, etc. Everyone has their own need and because we're not all the same, it's the activism that happens at that level that kind of ripples upwards. Well, it also feels like in the, in the Latino community there's some homophobia and, mm -hmm. in, and uh, in the gay and lesbian community, the, you know, racism mm -hmm. must feel as though that even having pride in it sort of intersectionally is also is, is something in, that requires, I think, developing it, that requires this, you know, gathering and meeting and being together with people that we know. That, that's the wonderful thing of having pride festivals and having gay and lesbian centers and having people who are out on city councils is it enables people to feel, especially like within the Latino community, where there is a lot of homophobia, where people are, you know, being, stepping outside of the norm is, it can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And for people to see these institutions and to see these people out and going about their business and really being out there, they feel a little safer and they feel that they can take, maybe at times it's just a baby step, maybe sometimes it's just they leap head on. Um, it, it provides the safe opportunity for them to do, to make these actions, whatever they may be, whether it's just simply, you know, waking up in the one morning and saying, I feel good about myself, I'm a gay man, I'm a lesbian, I feel good about myself, and even something as gentle as that can be an enormous stride within many, many communities. Do you see any conflicts, though, in terms of these? I mean, I know that over the course of other, the history of other movements, there's sometimes been a tension between the, the street activists, between the institutionalized or the social services approach, which it was interesting when Morris said when they first started the center they insisted, and I think it's one of the things that makes the center unique in the country, mm -hmm. that it was going to be political. It was about political activism, but it was also about social services. Mm -hmm. That we would, if you came to the center, you were either coming there to do for someone mm -hmm. or to organize for the community or to get services, and that, mm -hmm. you know, confluence was really important. But is there a conflict? Let me ask you, John, you may, I don't know, maybe you might have been criticized or for, you know, going into the larger world. I don't mean necessarily I'm sure I've been stand. criticized <laughs> for something along the yeah, way. Yeah, I, I don't think you can take a stand and not be criticized. But I know in other parts of the country there's some conflict, and uh, we haven't seen it so much here. I think there's, there's inherent tension. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily bad. Uh, the street activists may want something and not understand fully um, your limitations as a government. Um, the center, which does a tremendous uh, amount of work and does a great job, we fund them and they're a contract agency and we have to supervise and monitor that contract and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do under the contract. Now, sometimes we may find that what they're doing doesn't meet the terms of the contract well, the way we've written. Well, that's never happened with this center, though. Of course it has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but we, have to, we have to play that role. Uh, and that's not always comfortable. It's not always comfortable saying to a street activist, no, we can't do that. It, it's wrong. It's not good for the whole community. We have to look out for everyone, not just this isolated group in the community. Do you and, find, though, that it helps that they keep the pressure on? I mean, I've, uh, in cer certain circumstances, I've, where I'm up lobbying, I'll mm -hmm. say, well, you better talk to me or you're yes. going to have to talk to them. Yeah, you know? absolutely. <laughs> and, I, but we've met before to kind of work mm -hmm. that out, you yeah. know, like, would you make a lot of noise at about yes, 3.05? Right. Right. <laughs> you can stand there and say, I'm holding them from the door, yeah, but you just right. get this small I mean, concession you know, from you. They may not listen to me, mm -hmm. I don't know. I was in Washington for the march and doing some lobbying, and, and I, I go back a lot, and I, I'm always talking about the same issues, but having the presence of a lot of other people there who were much more vocal, much more, uh, I think, um, disconnected with the political system. I think that helped those people who are connected to be able to convince people that they do need to take some action. Uh, when, when you were talking earlier about having that safe place in the community, I really related to that because um, having the presence of the center uh, and having that kind of activity and having the street activists gives you the ability and the courage and the, the safety factor that you need to be out in other aspects of your life. I mean, you, you know what it's like being well, out in the entertainment yes, field or I the was, legal field. I'll or, tell you though, I was amazed when I was in Washington because I think I probably think of myself primarily as a privileged white woman mm -hmm. with a responsibility to share that privilege or use it for something. Mm -hmm. 
But when I was in Washington and it was all us, and for the first time I was in a majority of queers, mm -hmm. I realized how we really sublimate, how much we keep inside that we don't live in a queer world. Because everywhere I went, I knew that if I were to make a comment to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, an, a lesbian joke or something, mm -hmm. or, or an, a comment about things that are, we share as our mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. um, everybody at the table would laugh because they would all know. I mean, I, I saw a table full of guys looking around this restaurant that was just raw wood and metal and had nothing been done in terms of decorating it, you know? And I said, boy, it sure looks like a couple of lesbians did this place, you know? And you could, mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't walk into any restaurant in town and right. say that right. and get a laugh. I mean, I could say it because they're probably not going to kill me, you know. But it was all of a sudden I realized that we, we really do keep a lot of pain inside in terms of sort of living in the straight world. Well, you know, the other, you know, that's very interesting you, you talk about that because I went to Colorado before the elections uh, to work in Colorado for the Human Rights Campaign Fund who sent people all across the country. And uh, there were a lot of interesting things like I felt like uh, queer people were like running the field operations for the Democratic Party in many, many states, uh, and I think a lot in Colorado. Mm. Uh, but there, where we aren't in LA, we aren't in New York, we aren't in DC, we aren't in a, in a large city that's had a, a very long history, they do have a community center. But even with that, I felt uh, in almost every group like, uh, like I was uh, even we had debates there were debates between the people who were voting for no on nine or yes on, uh, no on two or yes on two which was the amendment the anti-gay uh, and debates lesbian. within the community no. no debates you know in with them right debates and people would not come out the room would be littered with gay men and lesbians and I felt like look I'm an outsider coming here to work I'm not going to speak and inevitably at the end I would stand up and say you know I just want to start off by saying I'm a lesbian and you know and the fact that no one in this room has said I'm a gay man or lesbian has to do with the level of homophobia, the level of hatred, and the problems here. And the other interesting thing about that campaign was the, the right wing who were switching from abortion now to anti-gay stuff, you know, kind of moving with the times or with the money, uh, in mm -hmm. my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, ran commercials with, uh, with uh, African American women, with Hispanic men saying this will water down our rights uh, if you if you don't uh, pass this bill, uh, which in effect says you know uh, you cannot uh, that that there can't could not be the anti discrimination yeah can't be anti discrimination class yeah anti discrimination laws passed so it was amazing to see that level of uh, of attempting to divide our community which is why for me it's very critical that people realize we aren't aff all affluent white men uh, uh, in high profile positions vacationing in Europe as as their literature put out. Uh, we at the center serve incredible uh, numbers of homeless, et cetera, people. And it's important for us as a community, I think, to keep building around the sense that we are lots of communities uh, and putting that, that forward and having that pride and helping bring that pride where, uh, where it's hardest. Uh, Indeed, we, we kind of have the chance to be one of the first communities where that's succeeded where, I mean, I think we're still in the struggle and I think we'll be in the struggle for a long time against our own isms. And, uh, but I think because we are in every community, but all those communities generally have rejected a lot of us and we come mm -hmm. together as people of color, as disabled gays and lesbians, as you know, men and women, that we have an opportunity in a sense to have mm -hmm. a kind of a new kind of pride. We were talking about this a little bit yeah. on the phone last night. A, a, a sense of pride in a culture as a people. Um, it, one of the, the points that's been kind of touched on is um, a lot of the people would stumble, especially with this gays and lesbians in the military, and somebody will say, you know, we're a people, you know, blah, blah. And somebody will inevitably stand up and say, how dare you compare yourselves to our community, whether it's the Latino community or, or the Afro-American community. How dare you compare yourself? You, you have no comparisons. And people stumble. A lot of our national leaders have stumbled at that point. And it's because they, don't know, how to answer they don't know how to come back from that. And it's like, and people can't seem to understand that, yes, we are exactly. a community. We have a very long history. I mean, you can go back as far as their recorded record. And we, we are there. We have, you know, an enormous amount of contributions to society and in all societies. And people just seem to stumble and falter and say, well, we're not. And it's like, no, we, yes, we are. We are people. We are a culture. We have um, 
a whole background of information. Uh, Morris is the living embodiment of our, of our <laughs> history. Somebody's got to I mean, do an oral history should, like, for 20 years with him. put a little tap on him and turn on the I valve know, and just get true. it all out and let everyone know that, yes, we are a community. Yes, we have perspectives that nobody else has. Well, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword for us because think about it. Isn't this a weird thing to have to be proud about? Okay, here's what I'm proud of. I sleep with women. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that's the difference that's been identified as the difference. Mm -hmm. And we're herded into enclaves on the basis of that difference, and that's it. And out of that, like every other oppressed group herded into an enclave, whether it's real or mental, we had to develop something out of it because they told us we were less than human. But isn't it a weird thing to be proud of in a way? It's like you have to develop pride around your difference, even though they're the ones that identified the difference. You know, they, yeah. they it's, made it's, us. It's different in the fact that for many years we kept saying, well, we're just like you. The only thing that's different between you and me is what I do in my bedroom, the privacy of my bedroom. And now it's coming back to like, no, you know, because I sleep with men and because I have a my spouse is male, I view the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, the oppression I've had to deal with as being a gay man and being a uh, Chicano, I mean, the oppression I've had to overcome has given me a different perspective of viewing the world. And that perspective has led me to be the person I am. Being a Chicano alone was not what made me who I am, being a Chicano gay male. So there's a richness about it. I mean, I know there is. I see our art. I hear our music. I, you know, I've, be, I've been to a million meetings. Um, there's a richness to our community. Um, I, I wish we had more time. This is some of my favorite stuff that I do, but of course, time is up because they only give us an hour for this show. So thank you very much, all three, for your contributions to our discussion on pride. Uh, there'll be some phone numbers flashed at the uh, end of the show, maybe even now as I speak. I never know. Um, about how to get in touch with lots of different places, including uh, Christopher Street West around our uh, Pride Festival and uh, March here. Hope you really enjoy it. Be proud and get used to it. <laughs>